Hi, and welcome back to our channel Summaries of a Bookworm. Your number one place for all who need or like to listen to book summaries. Let's start with the book summary of today. Zaytown by Dave Eggers is a scary book that tells the story of how the terrorist threat to the United States led to terrible and unexpected results. In 2005, Abdulrahman Zaytown was a Syrian immigrant who had lived and worked in the U.S. for 17 years, the last 11 of which were in New Orleans. He built a successful business, Zaytown A Painting Contractor LLC, which was the name on the logo on the back of his old truck. Zaytown had more than one job site in the city. His wife Kathy took care of the office and administrative work. Abdulrahman and Kathy Zaytown lived in their two-story house on Dart Street with their three daughters and Kathy's son. The Zaytowns also owned a building that was both an office and a warehouse. They also had six rental properties with 18 tenants. Then Louisiana was hit by Hurricane Katrina. Kathy ran away with the kids, first to her sister's house in Baton Rouge and then to a childhood friend's house in a Phoenix suburb. Zaytown refused to go anywhere. He told his wife that he had properties to watch over and that their house would be safer if he was there to fix holes and leaks. When the levees broke, Zaytown moved valuables to the second floor of their house and waited out the storm there. Soon, he was sleeping in a tent on the roof and paddling an old canoe around the city. He helped save people who were still in the city and needed help. He also fed dogs whose owners had left them. He found other people who had stayed behind and were helping each other. Together, they turned a Zaytown property on Claiborne Street that was not flooded and had a working phone into a small emergency center. He had never felt so urgent and on a mission before, Egger says. Eggers tells this story from Zaytown and Kathy's points of view as they go through the hurricane and try to stay alive and in touch. As the drama builds, Eggers tells us more about the characters' pasts. Zaytown grew up in a large, successful family in a small Syrian coastal town. Many of the more than a dozen photos in the book are of this family. He worked on ships for 10 years, at first for his older brother Ahmad. He ended up in Houston, stayed in the U.S., and then moved to New Orleans. Kathy is 13 years younger than Zaytown. She was raised in Baton Rouge as a Southern Baptist, changed to Islam, met Zaytown, and got married to him. Their story is an example of the American dream coming true when people work hard at marriage, family, and work. Eggers spends more than half of the book telling the story of Katrina and the people it affected. However, the real tragedy is not the natural disaster that follows, but the one that was caused by people. Zaytown and the three friends who have been helping him are rushed from the Claiborne House to the New Orleans Union Passenger Terminal by six police and military people. In the station parking lot, chain-link fences with razor wire on top are used to make outdoor cells for them. No one tells them why they are being held, but their civil rights are taken away right away, and they can't even call anyone. They are thought to be thieves, but because Zaytown and Nasser were born in Syria, they are also thought to be terrorists. After a few days in these cages, where Zaytown can't sleep on the dirty ground and where he can't eat the food because it has pork in it, he and the other prisoners are taken to the Hunt Correctional Center, which is 40 miles north of New Orleans. There, people are still being hurt. Zaytown and Nasser are put in a cell that is 6 feet by 8 feet, and Zaytown, who is sick and has been for a while, is not allowed to see a doctor. The book is split into five parts, and Zaytown goes missing during his ordeal in the third and middle parts. In this part, the story of the Zaytowns is told only from Kathy's point of view, as she gets more and more worried about finding her husband. All she can think about are the 28,000 guns that have been rushed into New Orleans by the National Guard, Blackwater, and other police and military units, and all she can picture is her husband being shot and dying in a jail or hospital without anyone knowing. Part 4 of the book starts 30 pages later when Eggers picks up Zaytown's story and tells the readers what happened to him between the end of Part 2 and the beginning of Part 3 when he was arrested and put in jail. Zaytown is finally questioned by the Department of Homeland Security at the Hunt Correctional Center, but it becomes clearer and clearer that no one is responsible in the chaos that followed Katrina. You're FEMA's problem, the guards at Hunt tell him. We don't have you locked up. Zaytown knows that, something is wrong with the country. This fourth section ends with more frustrations. A hearing for Zaytown is set up, but then it is cancelled for no reason, and the character witnesses that Kathy and a lawyer have found are thrown out. 300 pages into Zaytown, Kathy finally sees her husband again. After 23 days, he has lost 20 pounds and looks like a sad old man to her. Part 5 is the closest thing to a happy ending that can be found in a tragedy like this. In the fall of 2008, three years after the hurricane, Kathy is still having a lot of health problems, like forgetting things. The tests were done on her show that she has post-traumatic stress disorder. 
She says that the worst part of the whole thing was when she found out that Zaytown was still alive at Hunt Correctional Center. A missionary who was giving Bibles to prisoners took Zaytown's phone number and called her, but he was not allowed to see her or even tell her where a court hearing might be held. The worst thing was when an unknown woman on the phone said that the location of the hearing was private information. Zaytown's problems don't go away when he gets out of prison. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, sends a trailer to the family's house, but it sits there unused for months because FEMA doesn't send the keys or steps to get in. At last, the trailer is taken away without being used. Zaytown is back at work, but Kathy is now working less. Zaytown's brother lives in Spain, so the couple named their son Ahmad after him. While Zaytown was missing, his brother worked hard to find him. He sent emails all over the world to try to find him, and then he helped Kathy free him. Zaytown and his crews have fixed up 114 homes in New Orleans. The family business is back on its feet. Legal help for Zaytown's situation is hard to find, though. The people who arrested Zaytown don't take responsibility for what happened to him later, and Zaytown can't even get his wallet back from the people in charge at the Amtrak station. A deputy district attorney tells him that it is being kept as proof. He won't say, though, what it is proof of. Eggers doesn't say much about his story because he knows it speaks for itself. It's clear that no one person is to blame. Zaytown's ordeal was instead caused by systemic ignorance and failure. Zaytown was arrested because he was from the Middle East, because the United States was still reacting to the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, in terms of security and culture, and because the federal government treated Katrina as if it were or could become a terrorist attack. In his weekly radio address, President George W. Bush talked about how the storm was like the September 11 attacks and the war on terror. Kathy was in Phoenix when she heard this. When everyone is so crazy, rumors and confusion are bound to happen. Soldiers didn't listen to Zaytown's warnings about other people who were stranded, even though the government sent boats to help. Racist ideas about murders in the city were spread by the news. The chief of police even said on national TV that babies were being raped in the Superdome, where many people took refuge from the flooding. While Zaytown and the others were being held in the chain-link cages at the passenger terminal, they realized from the new materials that this makeshift prison must have been planned within a day of the storm. The difficult and complicated job of building and staffing these outdoor cells, which would eventually hold more than 1,200 men and women, was done while people in New Orleans were trapped in attics and pleading for help from rooftops and highway overpasses. Hundreds of cases of water and ready-made meals were sent to the guards and their prisoners, while people in the city nearby were fighting for food and water. In this natural disaster, everyone's sense of what was important was messed up by the government's focus on terrorists. Given how the federal government thought, Zaytown's tragedy was bound to happen. In one of Eggers's introductions to the book, he quotes Mark Twain, To a man with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The last ten pages of the book are appendices. They explain a lot and give a little bit of hope. The first appendix talks about the Zaytown Foundation, which was started in 2009 by the Zaytown family, the author, and the publisher to help rebuild New Orleans and promote respect for human rights in the United States and around the world. Eggers makes a list of 10 nonprofit groups that were the first to get money from the sale of Zaytown. Some of these are Rebuilding Together, which fixes up the homes of people with low incomes, and The Green Project, which sells building materials that have been saved from around New Orleans. Eggers lists the people he and the Zaytowns want to thank in the section called Acknowledgements. He also lists the books and articles that were important to his project and the agencies and organizations that gave him the information he needed. In the last section, Process and Method, Eggers talks about how the book came to be. Voice of Witness is a book series by McSweeney that uses oral history to bring attention to human rights crises. Voices from the Storm came out in 2005. The story of Zaytown in that book struck Eggers. Over the next three years, he did research and talked to people to write the book. Zaytown is a simple story with a compelling flow, and Eggers is smart enough to let the story tell itself. But Eggers is also a novelist, one of his many jobs, and the style of the book shows how much he cares about language. In particular, animal imagery is used over and over, there are dogs everywhere. They are barking because they are hungry, floating dead in the floodwaters, and even keeping watch over the cages at the bus station, which is ironically called, Camp Greyhound. Zaytown and the other prisoners are all locked up in cages and treated like animals. After Zaytown is set free, the most horrifying thing that happens in the book is that when he goes back to the house where he used to feed the dogs, they are all dead. Eggers says that the line between people and animals is very thin. Early in the book, Zaytown starts to wonder why Americans sometimes don't live up to their ideal. 
Zaytown shows that American democracy can sometimes fix itself with the help of dedicated people and groups. Thank you for listening to our book summary. I hope we sparked your interest in the book. Please let us know in the comments below and give this video a thumbs up. Do you want to listen to more book summaries? Subscribe to us and you will get a notification every time we publish a new summary. Bye bye and see you next time.